We're continuing our series in Ecclesiastes this past week and tonight. And in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, we read these words in the first verse. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth. And I thought, we thought we would, the best way we could highlight that is to invite um, some of our young people up. And they're just simply going to answer or add, just going to share some of their thoughts as they've experienced some things this summer um, recently in the last number of weeks, some have just finished. Mark has finished one schism. We'll go to another schism tomorrow. Um, so I'm going to invite uh, Rachel, Simon, and Mark, if they could come up. If you could just grab that microphone. Keep it nice and close. It's quite loud. And I'm just going to ask you some questions, and I just want you to share. Um, it'll be great to hear from you. So um, all three of you were at Summer Madness, but Rachel and Simon are going to talk about that. And Mark is specifically going to be talking about schism. And my question to you guys is, what has had the biggest impact of everything you heard when you were there? And the second part of the question is, as you guys were journeying through that, um, what did you learn about God um, in those moments? So I went to a sermon on Esther, and it was very much about how we're chosen as Christians to fulfill God's plans. So God chose Esther and put her in this specific situation that she had to make a difference to save the lives of many Jews and how we need to do the same and really use the tools that God gives us to fulfill our chosenness, I guess. Um, I went to a seminar on the story of Elijah and Elijah was able to run faster than chariots and animals brought him food and he was able to control the weather and it just stuck out to me because God is all powerful and that he'll help us in our times of need. the time then yeah um for me the reward of serving um i remember uh summer manis i used to be coming back just absolutely buzzing for god but i didn't get that this year and i felt quite empty leaving from summer manis yes i learned a lot and there's great speakers great seminars and great worship but i didn't have that same buzz um however i'm just back from schism in port bontre and the th- i'm on fire for god from serving You know, and you really get back from serving God because when you're telling kids every single day that God loves them, it becomes real and it's present and it's here and it's something that just revives your soul. So for me, the reward of serving. While you have the microphone, Mark, you can just keep a hold of it. Um, Some of the things that have stood out in your personal faith, what have you been learning about God in those moments at SISM? It kind of overlaps with my first answer. Um, Something I was asked uh, several times is, you know, my favorite Bible verse. And kids who write you letters when you're in Port Montre and you have to write replies. And the reply of each letter, I wrote the verse John 1, 14. The word um, is, it well, is, it, hold on, does it won't quote it? Should I test? No? Because no. I'm starting to forget it. <laughs> the word made his, dwell- no, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Sorry, I hesitated there. Um, the idea that the word tells us who it is and the made flesh, the, ex- you know, the extent God went to just to tell us he loved us and the fact he's dwelling. He didn't leave, he, he's still here and that whole offer of love still remains. So for, that is what was impacting me because I had to tell these kids every day and the teaching of kids is incredible because they have to strip back of everything and just left with the simplicity raw gospel. And, um, yeah, it just re- revives your soul and stays with you. Same question. Yeah, we'll pick brother and sister and it, but go for it. <laughs> um, so what really impacted me was all the young people worshipping God and supporting each other in that. And it was a big encouragement to me, but I think it was for everyone else as well. I think the thing that really stood out to me was like just realizing how much God actually did love us because I feel like we say all the time God loves us but we don't really feel actually the extent of that so I feel like being surrounded by everyone in the big tent when we're all worshiping you really just do feel like God loving everyone and like everyone around you. If you take that with you thank you so much for sharing um thank you so much to you guys and i hope i think it is our prayer as they journey through the rest of their lives that they remember um these truths that they learned as teenagers and as they journey for the rest of their lives
pray. I want to say a word to Mark. 50 years ago, I was a young teenager at Port Ballantrae, CSSM, and it was because of people like you back then that I am where I am now and what I have been able to, able to be. And I actually met at the Port Stewart Convention. I met this week one of the leaders who corresponded with me for two or three years through the winter. And you have no idea how much encouragement that was because our school didn't have a, a, a really functioning SU, which many schools now do, praise the Lord. But think not just for your week or two weeks, but think forward to what some of those young people, children might be. Praise the Lord that you've been there. This and keep contact with folks and encourage them. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you that as we gather you're already present. Thank you for the life that you inspire in your people. Thank you for the joy that we share in knowing that you are our Savior and you are our Lord. We give thanks for all those who down through the centuries and generations have known you and served you. Thank you for your faithful servant used by you in what we call the Old Testament. Those who prepared your people for the coming of Christ. Thank you for disciples who walked with Christ. Thank you for the infant church that through the inspiration of your spirit faithfully recorded his life and ministry. Thank you for those who have stood firm and declared the name of Christ even when there was opposition oppression and rejection. And for those who, whether here or in other fellowships, taught us to love the name of Jesus. For those who, through their words and deeds, made him real for us as well. Thank you for the life of your people through the centuries and across our world today. Thank you that despite our weaknesses, our failures, and our sins, still by your grace we are the people of God. Thank you for the fellowship, the joy, and the hope that we share in Jesus. And we ask that by your Holy Spirit working in us, we might be enabled to live for Christ to speak his name and to show him forth. Hear our prayer that we offer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Tonight's reading is taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, which is on page 677 of the Pew Bibles. Remember your creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain, when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, when the grinders cease because they are few and those looking through the windows grow dim, when the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, when men rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint, when men are afraid of heights and of dangers in the streets, when the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along and desire no longer is stirred, then man goes to his eternal home and mourners go about the streets. Remember him, before the silver cord is severed or the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring or the wheel broken at the well and the dust returns to the ground it came from 
and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. Not only was the teacher wise, but also he imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goats. Their collected sayings, like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them. Of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. If you weren't with us this morning, we were trying to advance the education of some younger folk by playing a song from my era. We didn't manage it, but we're going to try a bit of it now. Thanks, James. We, we cut it off there. That, uh, apart from a phrase at the end and the title, turn, 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 is pure Ecclesiastes 3. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to uproot, a time for everything, which is why we sought to play it. But actually, there's another point that I I want to make before I start properly into this evening, and I was saying to some of you this morning, sometime the devil gets in the technology Last night, my computer froze as I was starting the PowerPoint for this evening. I went to print out stuff this morning. The printer didn't work. It was out of ink. Did I have a spare cartridge? Praise the Lord, I did. (laughs) And then this happened. We talk about praying for our services, and you often think of praying for those of us who preach, You maybe even pray sometimes for those who do music, but actually we're so reliant on technology now for so many things. You ought to pray for that as well, that the devil would be defeated in the technology. So that's just another wee lesson there. Easter Sunday, we were in Florence And the first thing that morning, I saw a strange but impressive procession moving through the older part of the city. It's called the, and excuse the Italian pronunciation, Scapio del Caro, the explosion of the cart is the literal translation. It goes back to the Middle Ages, which is why they're all dressed like this. That was a time when the men of the city came back victorious from the first crusade, So it's been around a long time. And what happens is a large cart, see it, is towed through the city to the Duomo, which many of you will know is the big cathedral, where just before the main Easter Sunday service, lots of fireworks in this cart are lit. And here's what it looks like. It's quite something, quite spectacular and very noisy. So there was a crowd, perhaps about 10,000 people in the surrounding streets and in the uh, place in front of the cathedral watching this. But let's go back to the cart picture. Look what's pulling the cart. Look closely. These are oxen, larger than ever, any cattle ever I've seen in my life. And I was half raised on a farm. You can see a man beside the oxen with a blue with a blue shirt on, and the top of the oxen is higher. These are big animals towing this. But look more closely at the man. 
See what he's holding? Oh, you maybe don't see it in his left hand, but he's holding, holding a stick, a prod, a goad. And when he wanted the oxen to move, he's pushing them to move. In verse 11 of what Pip read for us, we read about goads. The words of the wise are like goads. Their collected sayings like firmly embedded nails. There are many wise words in this book of Ecclesiastes. And so far we've only touched on three chapters. But as we journey in life, sermons are intended to be a goad for us to seek God. And that's what the writer of Ecclesiastes is wanting us to do. Seek God. Go forward. The book is about a journey, as I said last week. The journey of someone's search for meaning. It might be a bit like a personal journal, we might say. And for much of the journey, it seems a futile search. We thought last week about work and pleasure and achievements and how everything he tried seems to lead to a dead end. The refrain, meaningless, meaningless, it appears here again in chapter uh, 12, verse verse 8. That, I remind you, suggests a wisp of smoke, your your breath visible on a frosty morning, something that's ephemeral. The thrust of the book is to show that life under the sun or on earth, if that's all it is, is life without God, that is futile, absurd, lacking in substance. Meaningless, ephemeral. But away at the start, there might have been a frustration of feeling that nothing matters much. But by the time we get to the end of chapter 12, the teacher has reached the conclusion that Everything, deeds, unseen motives, everything matters and matters eternally since everything comes under God's judgment. Verse 14, for God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. But let's rewind. As Michael at the beginning of the interview says, chapter 12 starts with, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Why should we? Why should we remember our creator in the days of our youth? There are half a dozen reasons here, and I'm going to go through each of them some briefly. Firstly, One day, we're going to die. Did you hear the graphic word picture of the limitations of old age? For example, verse 2, before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain, when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men stoop, when the grinders cease because they are few and those looking through the windows grow dim, when the doors to the street are closed and the sound of grinding fades, when men rise up at the sound of birds, but all their songs grow faint, and so on. The image is comparing an older person to a house that's crumbling with decay. And then in in, uh, the latter part of verse 5, there's the image of the grasshopper. And typically, grasshoppers spring high in the air. But here's a grasshopper who's scraping itself along the ground. It's surely soon to be a goner. And then in verse 6, death is likened to the snapping of a silver cord and the shattering of a golden bowl. Something precious and beautiful is broken. Change the metaphor. Death is like a wheel broken or a jar shattered at a well for drawing water. 
To die is to return to the dust. Verse 7. That curse that God pronounced on Adam and on all our sin in Genesis 3. And one day our bodies will go to the ground and our souls return to their maker until the resurrection of the dead. These are the sober realities of life and death in a fallen world where people rebel against God and go their own way. Of course, nowadays, many people choose to ignore that reality. But we all have to face it, whatever age we are. The second thing is, what happens then at death has implications for the way we live today. If we're left to our own devices, we tend to live forward. We look for what's going to happen this week, next week, next month, September, next year. We live forward and a week turns into a month and a month turns into a year. We're not long into July, but before we know it, it'll be Christmas. Sorry if that's depressing. We don't know the future, but we plan and hope and dream of where we will be, what we'd like to be doing, and who we might be with. We live our lives forward. But Ecclesiastes teaches us in a way to live life backwards. It encourages us to take the one thing in the future that's certain, namely our death, and to work backwards from that point into all the details and decisions and heartaches of our lives and to think about them from the perspective of the end. The destination makes sense of the journey. So if we know for sure where we're heading, then we can know for sure what we need to do before we get there. This book of Ecclesiastes invites us to let the end of our lives sculpt our priorities, our ambitions, and our strongest desires. By the way, the thrust of this point comes from this book, Living Life Backwards, uh, written by uh, David Gibson, uh, who's a minister in Aberdeen. And um, he used to live in Dundonald, um, and I'm grateful to Clifford Smith for pointing this out to me and, and loaning the book uh, to me. I'm going to give it back to him. Um, so what happens at our death has implications for the way we live today. Looking forward to that point and adjusting what we will do and what we will be. Third thing to say is he is our creator. He is the source of our youth. He is the source of our strength, whatever our age. So today is a day to praise the God who made you. Celebrate the gifts God has given you. Our capacity of reason, our skills in communication, our creativity in music and the arts, our strength in sports and athletics, the heart we have for friendship, our compassion for those in need. Praise God for making us. He is our creator. He's also our savior, our redeemer. In Colossians 1 verse 16 we read, in him all things were created, Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. So Jesus is not just our creator. He's also our redeemer. By his death on the cross, all our sins are forgiven. The unkind words you said to somebody in the family, maybe at lunchtime, maybe yesterday, the scornful criticisms you made 
of those who didn't deserve them. The unclean desires of our hearts and minds. The thoughtless lies in which you were caught out eventually. Maybe petty theft or a proud idolatry. Jesus forgives all our sins. And that's why we call him Savior. If we remember him, if we rely on him when we're young or indeed any age, we will find mercy for all our sins. The fifth reason is that the older we get, the more we forget. We may eventually forget things that nowadays we easily remember. We may eventually forget people that we love, which is a really sad situation. There's a very good movie on the problems of aging. It was on BBC this morning at 1.30 a.m., so I can't imagine many of you saw it. But it's called Iris, the life of the writer Iris Murdoch. Judy Dench plays the title role. If you've not seen it, it's worthwhile seeing. Forgetting things becomes a problem. But if we make a lifelong practice of remembering our Creator day by day, we will never forget the most important truths in the universe. We will always remember who our Savior is. And we will know that he has walked with us through life and all the promises that he had made to us for eternity. One of the more challenging things I did as a minister was to uh, take a monthly service in a home for people with dementia. Difficult because... Many of them could no longer read. So we had to have hymns that were well known. And after a while, I realized there's no point in giving out hymn sheets. Because if the hymn is well known enough, it's in here. And it comes out and people enjoy singing the familiar. The only problem was they wanted to sing Jesus Loves Me every month. And maybe that was all right. Maybe that was all right. But actually, one of the saddest bits of that was um, seeing the same people who were with you each month grow older and finding life more difficult. There was a lovely, quiet, uh, kind, thoughtful lady who on one of the latter occasions when I was there, I'd given a talk, it's basically a children's talk I gave, upgraded slightly, and it only lasted five or six minutes because that was their concentration. And this kind, thoughtful lady on that occasion said to me, is that all? Is that all you're giving us? Then I realized, you know, things had really taken hold of her uh, in, a, in a difficult way, not happy As we often say, old age is very difficult. We all know the name of John Newton, former slave trader who became Church of England vicar, the one who wrote Amazing Grace. Towards the end of his life, Newton said, although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. One, I am a great sinner. And two, Christ is a great saviour. Yes, people will forget things, but when through our lives we focus on God our creator, God our saviour, God our sanctifier, then these things will come to us when uh, memory fades. Sixthly, remembering the creator in the days of our youth, we can dedicate the rest of our lives to his service. When we remember God, when we remember Jesus, 
while we're charting our course in life, when we're making the major decisions that set us up for our whole adult lives, that gives a framework, a purpose for all that we do. The symbol on the right on the screen is IHS with a cross above the H. The children's talk that I do sometimes, it stands for Jesus, but actually it can stand for something else as well. IHS in his service, which is what all those who are in Christ are all about. We have a family saying whose meaning goes back to the uh, night before Angela and I were married. Um, we had gone with my future in-laws to the hotel to make sure everything was okay for the reception and to put the place cards out. Not one table was set up. Not one place was set. And my mother-in-law got really quite excitable. And it said at one point, it's not too late. At which point Angela and I looked at each other and said, time we were out of here. We never discovered it's not too late for, for whatever. But actually, as a phrase, it's important. It's not too late. It's never too late to give your life to Christ. But how much better to do so when you're younger? I think some of you will know this, though I, I couldn't immediately find the figures. But people are much more likely to come to Christ when they're younger than when they're older. The older you are, the harder it is to actually come to Christ and to trust him. When we're younger, dedicating the rest of our lives to his service. And then just one more. I should add in the best reason of all. We remember our creator because he remembers us. The God who created you rejoices that he made you just the way you are. He celebrates the gifts that he's given you, the way you've developed and the purpose he has for you in life. He's been thinking about you since eternity past. He had you in mind when he hung on the cross, when he was raised from the grave and when he ascended to glory. He's been watching over you each day of your life. And he will remember you. He won't lose track of you. So seven good reasons to remember our creator in the days of our youth. And we're at the end of Ecclesiastes. And in spite of the gloomy place where we started last week on the Sunday morning, at the end of the journey, we make the glad discovery that life is intact, that it's invested with meaning and significance, provided that we lift our eyes and remember our Creator. So how's your journey? How's it going? Where's it going? The teacher's long search has brought him to a decisive conclusion. Look at verse 13. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. Or as the message very pithily puts it, the last and final word is this. Fear God. Do what he tells you. Said at the start, goads are used to prod. Nails hold things in place. The teacher's words are both a warning to heed 
and a promise to hold on to. We deny them or defy them at our peril. Just one more point. The Jewish people would read Ecclesiastes at the Feast of Tabernacles. For a week, people would leave their houses and go and live in these booths. This looks like it's in a garden. These temporary shelters would be a remembrance to them of their wanderings in the wilderness. Ecclesiastes reminded them and us that life under the sun is transient, that lasting significance and satisfaction are to be found not in savoring and serving created things, not in gathering stuff, but in the Creator Himself. Lasting significance and satisfaction are to be found not in savoring and serving created things, not in gathering stuff, but in the Creator Himself. Which brings us back to Augustine, quoted him before. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. So everything matters. We need to respond to this God who has made us and who has saved us and who works in our lives if we will but allow him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that your word is a goad to prompt us, to stop us and make us think. Thank you that your word is a nail so that your promises are held out before us. Oh God, forgive us when we fail to see that in the to and fro and backwards and forwards of our lives that you're still at work calling out to us. Father, we thank you for this challenge again in this, cha in this chapter to remember you, our creator, in the days of our youth. And we ask and pray, Heavenly Father, that we, whatever our age, might put you right at the center of our lives. That you might make us the people you want us to be. That we might serve you and live for you to the glory and praise of your name. Amen. Let's join together in our prayers of intercession. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your loving care for us, which goes beyond time and space. We pray for our young people who are involved in outreach work this week. We pray for Ruth Gregg in Romania, for Ruth Seller in North Carolina, and for Mark heading off to Tullymore. We pray that you'd give them the courage and opportunity that they want to share the love that with those, to share your love with those who don't yet know you. And we pray that this would be a time when they can grow in their knowledge of you and in their love for you. We pray for the Walkway Summer Scheme as well, which will run over the next two weeks. We thank you for Mandy, for Gillian, for Michael, and for all who will lead it. We pray for the children who will come along, and we ask that they would see something of your love throughout this week. We pray this, that the seeds that are sown there would reap a great harvest for you. Remember those of our congregation who are ill or waiting for surgery or recovering from illness. Please be their strength and assure them of your love for them. We pray also for the families connected with Caris who may find it harder in the summer to cope. We pray that they would get the support that they need and we ask that as a church, we would have the eyes to see their needs and hearts that are open to help. 
We bring before you the older members of our church. Please bless the seniors as they meet for fellowship together at their barbecue. And we pray for those who are too frail or unable to leave their homes for whatever reason. And we ask that they would find their comfort in you. We pray for Frank. Please bring him through his surgery safely. And we pray that his sabbatical would be a time of refreshment and renewal for him. We pray for Sam and Emma and their children, that they would be able to enjoy their holiday and come back rested and refreshed. We pray for the leaders of our organisations, that they would be able to enjoy the summer break and find more time to read your word and reflect on your love. We thank you that you are the Lord of every age and stage of our lives. We pray that our, as, our, as our eyes fail, we would see you more clearly. As our hearing dulls, we would still be quick to hear your voice. As our speech falters, we would still be ready to speak of your love. We thank you that you love us no matter what. We pray that our prayer, we bring our prayers and petitions before you, knowing that you are the sovereign, gracious Lord who loves us. Amen.